Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Pray with me today. Holy God, we thank you for this portion of the service where we may ingest and digest your word. We pray that this word goes forth and takes deep root in each one of our hearts. We may be different, we may be changed, we may be better for you. God, we pray for increase today, both a spiritual increase, a physical increase, and we give you all the glory for all that will come. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart and mind say amen. amen. Let's give God one more hand praise here today. Amen. From the 10th chapter of Mark, verse 46, reading from the NIV, Mark 10 and 46, hear these words. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and says, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped on his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. You may be seated. <clears throat> Last week, we were blessed with a sermon from Reverend Riggles from the Carolinas. She blessed our souls, did she not? And what that sermon was used for is kicking off a new series here called A Better Me, A Better Me. We declare that we want to be better, but it has to be more than just lip service. We need a plan. We need focus. We need action. We don't need to just look in the mirror, but we must invoke actions that, we, we, that, that what we're looking at it's changing on the road to a better me. She spoke last week about with a title, I Refuse. Today's topic will be I Desire, followed by I Believe, I Give, I Forgive, I Commit, and I Rejoice. That's the series. And I pray that after this series, we will have grown, healed, gained a focus on the work of Christ that will be transformative in our lives and in our ministry and in this community that we can all look in the mirror and say, you know what? I see a better me. We're six weeks into this new year. We began the year talking about our PRP. You remember that? Our personal revival plans. Well, where are we? For many, we may not be where we hope to be, but hopefully we're further than we were when we started this year. I hear all the time people wanting to change something. I want to change jobs. I, I want to get better grades in school. I want to lose weight. I want to quit smoking. I want to know more about the Bible. I, I want to pray more. I want to be more active in church. I want to position myself for the Lord to use me greater. We all desire change in our life, but it seems that many times that this desire to change in our life is more of a noun than it is a verb. The desire that we speak from our lips is hung on the hearts, on the walls of our hearts, and it just, it just collects dust. It's nice to look at. We pass by it daily. 
But this desire that's hanging on the, heart, uh, on the walls of our heart, it, it, it doesn't have a motivating effect to change our lives. But I declare this morning, it's time to blow the dust off the desire hanging on the walls of our hearts and activate it. It's time to give this desire legs. It's time to talk less and do more. But, but we're not today without example. Thank you, Lord. And I believe that God has sent us this morning a blind man to help us activate our desire. And this man's name is Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus gives us seven basic steps for our desire activation codes. We're always looking for codes, right? Seven basic steps for the desire that we change. Seven basic steps to get out of this rut of hopelessness. To get out of this endless routine to, that, that we say we hate. But we continue the same routine day in and day out. Let me tell you this. Worship, yes, it is a time of celebration. It is a time of fellowship. It's a time of praise. But it's also a time of training. And, and if, if I'm going to be better for me, I have to prepare for this time of training by bringing my Bible, bringing a writing utensil, and being able to make some notes. And I get the fact that we're in a technological age where everybody has a cell phone. And sometimes people make notes on, on their cell phone. And I get that. And that's fine. But hear me out. There's a book in the Bible called Habakkuk. If you flip through it, you'll miss it. Table of Contents is definitely needed to find this one. But in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, hear these words. It says, then the Lord answered me and says, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he who reads it may run. You hear that? There are a lot of things. I don't know about you. There's a lot of things going on my cell phone day to day, right? But we need constant reminders of what we're focusing on. So we're going to need to write a note, put it on the refrigerator, Put it on the dashboard of your car. Put it in a mirror in your bathroom. Because the Lord is instructing us, write the vision you've been given for a better you. Make it plain. Means it needs to be in a place where I can see it often. I can be reminded of it so when I see it, it will then activate my desire for change and I can run and stop walking. Okay. Jesus had been preaching and teaching in the area around the Sea of Galilee. And our text says that Jesus and the large crowd were leaving the city, and a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Hear this. Luke also reported this same account. Uh, and, and from the two, what we can see is note that this wasn't the first time Jesus and the crowd passed by this man on the side of the road begging. So I can imagine in my mind that he's on the side of the road. He's positioning himself to be exposed to many travelers as possible because he made his living begging people. So the crowd came into the city. He inquired, what's going on? Who is this person? And he knew that it was Jesus, son of David. So here he is positioning himself because if they came in the city... He knows they're going to be coming back the same way. So I'm not going to miss my opportunity when he comes back by because I know this is now Jesus, son of David, the miracle worker. Okay, here we go. First step on activating our desire, what he shows us, we must assume responsibility for our own lives. We must assume responsibility for our own life. Many people talk about their problems in such a way that it's always somebody else's fault. Some teenagers blame their parents. If my parents were more like some parents blame their children, if it wasn't for you, we have workers who place blame on their coworkers or their boss. We find ourselves in this endless spin cycle of it's not my fault. 
There are things that will happen that are out of our control. We get that. But we, can, we, 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 we are in command of our reaction or our response to whatever happens to us. You ever heard people say, he makes me so mad. She makes me so mad. Question, who has control over you getting mad? It's you. The only person that can make you mad is the person that's in the mirror. True, people can say things or do things that can upset you, things that you don't like, things that hurt you, but we make the decision of how we respond to that action. And, and taking control of a situation is a desire to become a better responder, right? We, we hear all this time, this buzzword of first responders. They come in to make a situation better, to help it, to heal it, whatever the case may be. So we got to think of when things happen in our, in our life that, that I need to be a better first responder. Yes. Look at what Bartimaeus did. He didn't blame somebody else. He didn't think that God or anybody else owed him something. He was not just going to accept his present state if that, as though there was nothing that can be done to change it. So what did he do? He called out to Jesus. He knew his help was in a power higher than himself. He was not the one who made himself blind, but instead, he, he's not going to be blaming others. He's not blaming the world. He's not blaming God. He says, my situation right now is, blame, is blindness, but I know somebody the one who can do something about my present situation. So what did he do? He called out and he cried for help for the one who created sight. If we desire different things, we need to call out to the creator of all things. With our voice. Enough of this silent prayer. Silent prayer is fine. But trust me, a silent prayer for a sight wouldn't have got this man his sight on that day. Number two, second step. We need to believe we can change. We need to believe we can change. The blind man says, teacher, rabbi, I want to see again. He believed that Jesus would do something in his life that, that, that he wouldn't walk away the same when he had this encounter with Jesus. He believed that he'd be different. We have to stop thinking that the only way we're going to be different is if everyone around us is different. Too often, our prayers are pitiful and our desire collects dust when we pray prayers like this. God, if you could just change my boss. God, if you would just change my spouse. God, if you could just change these kids. If you could just change my cousin, my friend, my relative. See, God doesn't always change the situation. But what God does promise, that, that he'll change us if we allow him to. God will change that attitude, that outlook, that perspective. There's an adage that says this. Dress for the job you want, not for the job you have, okay? So, so if, if I want my attitude to be different, then I need to dress for it. If I want my marriage to be different, I need to dress for it. If I, want, uh, if I have a, a dress for a different work environment, I, 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 <laughs> how do you come to service every week? Do you come with the expectation of change? Do you expect to literally, we talk about it, we pray about it, do I want to leave this place different than I came in? Because church, if there's no expectation, then there's no change. We need to believe we can change. And it begins with the expectation of how we dress ourselves. I pray that you're following the metaphor. No, the pastor did not say run out and go on a shopping spree. <laughs> I'm trying to help because I already saw credit cards exploding right about now. I saw 
Amazon rolling right now. Pastor says I need to upgrade. I can do that. But what I did say is maybe your attitude needs a new suit. Maybe your attitude needs a new pair of shoes. Put some perm on that attitude. Lay it back. Third step, third step, focus, focus. Third step, we need to make it clear of what we need. Make it clear. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? See, specific prayers get specific answers. When people come and say, Pastor, pray for me. I say, what do you want me to pray for? Pray for everything. No, I'm not praying for everything. God called us seed planters, not seed scatterers. So if I'm praying, it needs to be specific. I said, do you, I said, you may not know what you want me to pray for, but I'm going to tell you what we need to pray for. What hurts you the most? Right now, what's hurting you the most? Because that has your undivided attention. That has you before me requesting prayer. So if we pray for that, a lot of these other things will take care of themselves. So what hurts you the most right now? Because that's what we're going to pray for. Just letting that sink in because that was, I know, it went there for me. Okay. Jesus already knew what the man needed. Jesus wanted the man to say it. We're coming up on Valentine's Day. Thank you, Lord, for dropping this on us today, right? How often do we play communication games with each other, such as a wife may say, he is not meeting my needs well, does he know your needs? If he loves me, he ought to know them. <laughs> well, that, that may be true. He ought to know them. However, that doesn't necessarily mean he does know them. <laughs> I know I was going to get some amens around that one. Jesus. Well, ma'am, you at times have to tell them what your needs are. I love helping my wife, baby. <laughs> but there are times when she needs to be specific. I need you to clean this room, fix this, go get that. Here's the list. Because my mind reader is in the shop and the parts are on back order. Jesus. Didn't even know you was going to get all that today. You're welcome. So what about a spouse that will say, I'm so mad at him. Well, does he have a clue as to why you're mad at him? For he may be slow to catch on. <laughs> How many have played this game? What's wrong with you? Nothing. Nothing. Well, if nothing is wrong, how, pray tell, will the situation change? And you know who else we play those games with? We play them with God. We say things like, you know, God knows everything. So if God knows everything, I don't have to tell God anything. Hmm? Yes. God wants us to tell him exactly what we need, exactly what we need, exactly what we need. Jesus meets our needs when we tell him what we need. And, and I found that, that many times when we tell God what we need and we go to God sincerely, he always does above and beyond what 
You ain't never prayed for a three and got a five. Okay. Um, we got to quit asking God for stuff just to be lazier. Mm. Now, now, this man was a beggar because he couldn't earn a living. So he was dependent upon others to have pity on him for a handout. That's how he earned a living. Notice he didn't ask for money because money, that means I don't have to beg anymore. He, he didn't ask for money because, you know, with enough money, I don't have to work anymore. He says, I want to see. I welcome the fact that with sight, I'm not going to be able to beg anymore. I welcome the fact that now I can work and earn my own living. I don't have to beg any longer. I want to see so I can follow Jesus. I want to be a testimony to the man that gave me sight, a testimony that now my praise is not insignificant anymore. This miracle of sight will cause others to call out to this man, Jesus, that I'm following right now. I want to receive sight to trade this faith for, for the gift of salvation. I, I, I'm no longer stagnant. I'm no longer sitting by this side of the road. I want to see so I can move. I want to move for Jesus. If your desire is a blessing to become lazier and do less, then our desire will still collect dust on the walls of our heart. Note to file. Quit praying to God to win the lottery. <laughs> Church folks. Did you hear me? I heard a pastor the other day praying. Okay. All right. What is your desire today? Have you made it plain? Let me be clear. Our desire to change is to be better for God. And to be better for God, we need to be closer to God. Stop asking God for things that will distract us, for, for things that will pull us away from God. Quit asking for God, God for things that are above your faith grade. You, you, you know if you got enough faith to receive that miracle, you may not be ready for it. Go, go study some more. Go pray some more. Go serve some more that that faith may increase. Okay. All right, stage four, ready? For this desire activation, we need to not be bothered by what other people say. Not be bothered by what other people say. What was the crowd telling him? Calm down. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. Be quiet. This isn't the right place. This isn't the right time. You don't come to Jesus like this. You shouldn't do that. Don't clap in service. Don't shout to Jesus. Who was that that said that amen? We don't do that around here. Church, we find ourselves in difficulty when we worry so much about what other people think. Wouldn't you believe in this case everybody was wrong? Everyone else told him that he shouldn't do it this way. But he didn't care what the practice was, what the formality was, what the religion was, whatever. If I need Jesus, I'm screaming for some Jesus because I want to see. He knew he needed help. So he refused to be denied by the naysayers. Have you prayed for change and God has not delivered that change? Well, keep calling on God. Is there a need in your life that has not been met? Keep calling out, Jesus, son of David, are you hurting now and you don't have the answer? Keep crying out to God. Are people telling you to give up? Are people telling you to quit? Are you people telling you that God doesn't care about you and your situation? 
Are you worried about what other people think or what other people are going to say? Or are you concerned about how it may look? They may call me foolish. Stop listening to the crowd, especially when you don't even know who's leading the crowd. I want you to hear something from Scripture. The crowd said no to the promised land, and they spent decades wandering. That's what the crowd did. The crowd made a golden calf to replace Jehovah God. The crowd stoned Stephen. The crowd yelled Hosanna and praised Jesus one week, and the next week, given the opportunity to save Jesus, the same crowd said, crucify him, put him on the cross. Look in the mirror and tell yourself this today. The crowd does not care about my well-being. The crowd does not care about my safety. And the crowd will tear me down just as quick as it built me up. A better me is not the one whose life is governed by what other people tell me to do or not to do, especially when it concerns my walk with Christ. Amen? Amen. Number five, we're getting them quick now. Stop waiting for the perfect conditions. Stop waiting for the perfect conditions. Verse 46 says, a great crowd was following. He, he, was, he, he was, was waiting beside the road. Others were already traveling with Jesus. Others already had their opportunity with Jesus. Bartimaeus, it seems that we have no chance. Did you know this was the last time Jesus would come to Jerusalem? If you would have missed it now, if you would have waited for more ideal conditions, church conditions, he'd have never been healed. We got to quit waiting for this just the right time. We have to quit waiting for the right opportunity to come along. How many times have you invited someone to church or to Bible study and the response is, you know what, I'm coming. I'm going to be there as soon as this. I'm going to give my life to Christ as soon as this. I'm going to join church uh, one day. We have to seize the opportunities God gives us when he gives them. We talked before about God not promising time. No one knows the day when their physical life on this earth will come to an end. There are people every day that leave home that will not return. But they leave with a thought, as soon as I get back home, I will. Next Sunday, I read a shirt one day at the gym. It was hilarious. It says, yesterday you said tomorrow. You get that? Two places we find ourselves when opportunities are before us. We say, I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. For a better me, I got to stop wishing I would have and be glad I did. Amen? Amen? Number six, and we're almost done. We need to do something bold and dramatic. We need to do something bold and dramatic. The blind man threw off his coat, jumped up, and went to Jesus. Don't know if he had some assistance or whatever, but I'm telling you, if I'm blind and there is somebody there that can give me sight, I heard his voice telling me to come. So I don't care if somebody's in my way. I'm knocking folks over. I'm getting to Jesus. Sometimes we have to do something different. Sometimes we can't just keep doing the same old thing. If we're going to break out of this rut, if we're going to make life to be different, we got to do something bold and dramatic. Too many of us have become situationally institutionalized. Situationally institutionalized. We, gotta, we, we, we stop thinking that we can be different. We don't believe that our present can be better than the past. We've become more fearful of receiving a miracle. And I did say fearful of receiving a miracle because you may be saying to yourself subconsciously, well, if God blesses me with this miracle, then there's going to be an expectation of a response to the miracle that I'm not prepared to make. 
Because when I receive that miracle, staying the same is no longer an option. Hmm. You may say you want to be different, but it's only talk. You know why? Because we're not shouting. We're not calling out. We're not writing down the plan. We're not following the plan. We're not throwing the cloak aside because obviously that was something that impeded him to come to Jesus. The Hebrew writer, chapter 12, verse 1 says, lay aside every weight, every sin that entangles us. It says to, to lay aside every burden, every sin, whatever it is that's keeping you from Jesus and making your life better, it's time to throw it, throw it to the side. What has you running from Jesus instead of running to him? What has you, what's holding you back from surrendering your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Blind Bartimaeus took off his coat and ran to Jesus. He did something bold, something dramatic, something different, something most blind people wouldn't do. How many times have you heard, well, I'm too old. Well, I'm too, I don't have time. Well, I never get a chance. Well, these are excuses of those who are situ situationally institutionalized. And we got to be break free of that imprisonment today for a better us. Last step, number seven, and we're done. Follow Jesus. Just that simple. What happened? He got his sight. He followed Jesus. He didn't get his sight and go into the town and be like, Look at these eyes. I'm seeing y'all now. Seeing up in here. No. He got his sight. He followed Jesus. So we follow Jesus in thought, in deed. No, no need in your life to wonder what did Jesus do. Follow what Jesus has already done. And, you know, let me talk about this following for Jesus for one second. You know how you will follow someone that if something jumps off, you can determine whether you're with them or not? <laughs> Many times that's how we follow Jesus, right? If you, you're following somebody, then all of a sudden somebody comes to that person and get ready to fight. Then you have a choice to make because you're following far off enough to where you can be with them. Or without them. And too many times we follow Jesus like that. When, when All of a sudden when it's time for the miracle, we're like, Jesus. But when it's time to defend our faith, we're like, I don't know him. <laughs> we cannot straddle the fence. When someone says, do you follow Jesus? Oh, yes. We can't follow Jesus as convenient Christians, undercover Christians. You ever seen that? All of a sudden they pull out the badge, undercover Christian. <laughs> we understand the miracle of salvation. And when we understand that, we'll realize that we've all been blind on the side of the road begging. This story is about all of us. But for, for me, I wasn't comfortable on the side of the road begging. I had heard of this man, Jesus, but when the opportunity came, I screamed. I shouted. I came down to my knees crying. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he did this, he gave me eyes that I don't see things the same way. My desire for things are different. I looked at my hands. They looked new. Looked at my, uh-huh. See, I, I no longer had to beg for anything. Because I serve a God now who's obligated himself to provide for all of my needs. I, I don't have to fight like I used to fight. Because I serve a God now that fights for me and he wins. 
I serve a God that activated my desire, and, and I will look in the mirror and say, I see change. I see different. Now I can look at myself and see the impossible. That's because of the God that saved me and gave me sight when I was on the road. All right. That's the sermon. But I want to talk to somebody else here today. Okay. There are some people that say, you know what, God, uh, you know what, Pastor, I hear that. But um, I'm not at that place where I'm on the side of the road begging. I may be a person that I, I gave my life to the Lord and I found myself estranged from the Lord. So I, 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 I kind of know the Lord. I was maybe one person that was following from afar off and I'm lost. I'm estranged. I'm just in need of direction because I'm just kind of feeling some kind of way, you know, if I give my life to, I, I, I'm just in a weird place because I used to be on fire for the Lord, but I'm not anymore. Now I just want to talk to you this morning. There was, um, th there was a young boy who had a little dog and, um, he was fond of that little dog, and one day the little dog took off running, and he was just running behind his little dog, and before he knew it, the little dog had ran almost a mile or two away. And the little boy looked up. He didn't see anything familiar, and he began to freak out. He was crying. What was usually familiar is not familiar anymore. I don't know anything around here. And there was a police officer that saw him on the corner crying. And he says, little boy, what, what, what's, what's wrong? He says, I'm lost. And, 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 and I follow my dog out here, and, and, and I don't know how to get back. And, and, and he says, so calm down, you know. I'm here to help, and we're going to get you home. He says, what's your phone number? We don't have no phone. Okay, well, what's your address? I don't remember what street I live on. And he just busted out crying again because he feared he'd never get home. The police officer says, calm down. He says, look, is there a landmark by your house somewhere where we can figure it out? The little boy looked up and he was excited. He says, yes. He says, near my house, there's a church. And that church has a tall steeple on it. And on the front door, it has a big cross. He says to the police officer, he says, do you know where that cross is? Do you know where that church is? And the police officer says, yes, son, I do. And that little boy says, well, if you get me to the foot of that cross, I can make it home from there. We serve... A God of reconciliation, restoration, and resurrection. And I don't care where you are in your walk right now. If you've ran out of town and you don't know your way home, you find yourself to the foot of that cross, and I guarantee you, you can make it from there. Let us pray today.